Good afternoon everybody and welcome to this regular Bush Right Lunchtime webinar. Uh, my name is John Reid and I'm taking the anchor role for today's talk which is entitled Mobile DSE Ergonomics. Now there may be some of you out there listening from uh, other countries who aren't familiar with what DSE means and it's uh, in the UK we uh, mean this to be display screen equipment that's the computers and peripherals that you use uh, to access your computer. Now, I'm very pleased today to say that our presenter is Matthew Bertels from the HSL. Uh, the HSL is the Health and Safety Laboratories up in Buxton in Derbyshire. And uh, HSL is an agency of the UK's Health and Safety Executive. And Matt's going to be talking about the many ergonomics issues uh, to do with the use of things like tablets, smartphones, and uh, laptop computers, and so forth. Something which is growing in uh, usage uh, almost hourly, I guess, these days. Um, but before before we start on the meat of today's program, uh, there are just a couple of housekeeping points that I need to mention. Um, essentially to do with the panel, the control panel on the right hand side of your screens. If you have any technical problems during the presentation, then the first thing I should say is don't worry, we are recording this and you can uh, look at it again next week on the Postrite website. But it may be that you can just type in a, a question or your problem on the panel there and our technical people will come back to you with a hopefully a solution. Um, Otherwise, if during the presentation you've got any questions for Matthew about the content, um, then please type those into the appropriate box there as well. And at the end of the session, I will try and put as, as many of these to Matthew as I can. Um, without taking up any more of his time, I'm going to hand over to Matthew to tell us about mobile DSE ergonomics. So, Matt, it's uh, over to you, please. That's great. Thanks very much, John. Thank you for the introduction, and thanks to Posture Right for hosting this on what's emerging as an increasingly important issue and something that we're all trying to find our way through. Um, just a very, very briefly about myself. Uh, my name's Matt, and I'm an ergonomist in the laboratory where we do an awful lot of work helping health and safety executives in the UK uh, develop their standards, develop their guidance, and do the research behind the guidance. And I've been dealing with, uh, like most ergonomists uh, across the world, but certainly in the UK since 1992, and it's, it's not a new element of, of something we do, but the mobile DSC is throwing up uh, new challenges uh, to you know, manage and to actually understand how we can get to grips with the possible risk factors. So what I thought I'd briefly cover just for the next 25 minutes is uh, these three topics here on the right, the level of exposure, and I think we all agree it's growing and growing at an exponential rate, just looking at some of the key risk factors that we may be familiar with, with musculoskeletal disorders in general, and just seeing if they are relevant to us in mobile DSC, and then offering up a possible solution, and it's not, uh, if you like, a HSC indoor solution yet, and I'll talk about that later on, uh, what HSC are doing on the topic, but in the meanwhile, it's something to consider and put in our policies as we, uh, as we start to manage this more and more closely. So, uh, the first topic, I suppose, is level of exposure, and we know that exposures uh, are up. If you look to the right-hand side of this graph, this is data just from Ofcom, and there's a, a couple of lines in particular that uh, are very important to us, and that's the growth of smartphones, which is a pink line to the right-hand side of the graph, and the growth of tablet PCs, which is a blue line to the right-hand side of the graph. And basically, over the years, what they're showing is they're not quite exponential, but not far off exponential growth. We still call these emerging technologies, but they're very much emerged and very much embedded in our home lives as well as our work lives. Just a bit, little bit more data about uh, our exposure to mobile DSC. Um, we know from uh, an awful lot of uh, the research that's been out there that the growth has been really very fast and furious, and I think that's one of the reasons that we've been caught out maybe with some of the management systems that aren't in place yet that perhaps should be uh, for managing risk. So tablet ownership has grown about 63% year on year. Um, and generally the growth is around Christmas, unsurprisingly the, 
the pricing, uh, the, the size and shape of these uh, products make them perfect for a Christmas filler. And uh, there's a, always a lot of growth in December and January. So about uh, a third of people accessing the internet do so via tablet PC these days. About a third of website clicks are via a tablet PC. And one in six, uh, sorry, six in ten adults say that tablet PC is their go-to device uh, for surfing the internet while at home. So what are we doing with our tablets and where are we? And this is a fundamental problem for us as assessors and people responsible for uh, managing the risk is that you know the majority of the use of these mobile DSC device is by very nature of their device mobile. They're not used at work all that much. They're used in the home and in the bedroom environment, in the living room environment. And while a quarter of us use them at work, it's an issue to get our workplace or work device management systems into people's homes. We don't rush around to people's living rooms and God forbid bedrooms doing DSC assessments. So it's really about finding a way of intervening for that home activity where we're not able to observe, not able to manage in a normal sense. Just to give us an indication of some of the effects of our exposure to DSC, there's some papers I've been reading recently which give some indication of the kinds of effects we might see. Um, we know um, from quite the historical evidence now, 2006, 2007, which is old data in, in the growth of these mobile technologies. We, uh, we do get increased musculoskeletal disorders with the increased mobile phone use. That we get increased uh, hours of handheld mobile uh, phone use uh, linked with increased neck, shoulder, and thumb pain, for example. We know that with uh, desktop, uh, sorry, with um, tablet PCs and mobile phones, we get increased head and neck flexion. Uh, we're looking down for a lot longer in the more pronounced way. Also, the hand that's holding the tablet the non-dominant hand that's not actually pressing the touch screen but actually holding the device. Um, evidence shows that we get increased shoulder flexion, shoulder loading and sustained pinch grip and EMG activity or muscle activity is, is obviously on the increase with that non-dominant hand. Again, um, in a non-dominant hand, increased uh, deviation from neutral while we're holding the device, so we're in a less neutral posture. Once again, more neck and trunk flexion and elevation of the shoulders in, in, a, in a separate study. Straker's work was doing a lot of uh, work on old tablets that were predominantly uh, desk-based, not hand-based. So a lot of that is akin to writing on a piece of paper on a, on a desk, for example. And then uh, Birello uh, was the one who, I guess from his work, the, 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 the term um, Blackberry thumb was coined, uh, using the dominant hand to press the buttons and the dominant thumb. So we know that there's in evidence, in the peer-reviewed evidence, there are effects of mobile DSC uh, use. We know that it's something that uh, will start to uh, manifest itself, possibly in symptoms. And so we'll take a traditional approach of looking at the traditional risk factors, which we know from all our musculoskeletal disorders research, and I'm sure these are familiar to any of you who've looked at musculoskeletal disorders assessments like my new handling, for example, where the key risk factors are posture, force, and exposure. And in terms of posture, we look at fixed and non-neutral postures. For forces, it's usually high forces, like you might see more akin with manual handling, but also repeated and prolonged forces. And the exposure is about duration and repetition of exposure, the kind of things we look at with upper limb disorders. So let's have a brief look at some of these, uh, uh, these risk factors and see if they do come into play and see if we can show they come into play with uh, mobile devices like tablets and mobile phones. So Posh, this is my son and I, he let me take photographs of him, he's half of me to show you photographs of him because he got an extra hour on his tablet PC the morning we were doing this. But this is very typical of tablet PC use on the sofa in a variety of postures. I think on this next image he actually was aware that I was taking a picture, you can see the smirk on his face there. But very typical postures, just left on his own to actually sit and use the device, he's probably on Minecraft knowing him. The question is, and the challenge really for us is, how we use this traditional model of, uh, of our office-based assessments, looking for neutral postures throughout the body, looking at workstation setup. And it's quite apparent and immediately apparent that this traditional model simply doesn't fit these kinds of usages where people are left to their 
own devices to use any furniture, any environment to use the device. There has been some really good research on postures with mobile DSC. Young's paper is, is very, very good. I'd commend it to you. There's a good all-round paper. And what Young did, she looked at the use of mobile device of a tablet PC in four different circumstances. She names them lap hand, lap case, table case, and table movie. And has subjects just use the uh, mobile devices in these four different circumstances for about half an hour while taking some very accurate measurements of the, the key risk factor postures like increased neck flexion, for example. When she was looking at this, she initially looked at two different tablets. I've called them tablet one, tablet two. It was actually it happened to be a, a, an iPad and a, a Motorola Zoom tablet. And what she found was there were some differences between the tablets. Tablet one, and both tablet one and tablet two actually found the biggest difference in neck flexion between using it on your lap or using it on, the, on a table and table mounted like in, it suggests a table movie in, the, in posture D at the bottom. So there was a great difference in putting a tablet on your lap and putting a tablet on a table. And the difference was predominantly in, in neck flexion, the forward bending of the neck. But she also found that in between the tablets, there were differences in behaviors with the tablets. And one of the tablets increased neck flexion, one reduced neck flexion. Similarly, one of the tablets increased gaze angle, the angle of your eyes looking downwards, while the other one reduced gaze angle. And looking at the oblique or the perpendicular viewing angle of the screen, some of the screens you looked at perpendicular, whereas some of them you could look at at an angle. And so there were differences in the tablets. And so she started to look at the tablets, but actually found the differences lay from the peripheral device. Uh, the peripheral kind of um, stands that you get with the tablets, the covers, the cover stands, and, and what those covers and what those uh, uh, peripheral devices let you do. And she found that some stands allowed the user to stand the tablet at a more preferred angle than others. Now that really starts to indicate to us what we can do with you know, some of the controls and some of the uh, uh, interventions to improve posture when we're using these tablets. And in this case, one of the preferred angles for certain uh, circumstances, lap case or table case, where you're physically touching the touch screen, she found approximately a 30 to 60 degree angle of, of inclination of the tablet was preferred. Whereas looking at a tablet for a movie, for example, an approximate 45 degree inclination was preferred. And that's uh, been found also by Alvin and McQueen late, earlier on. So it's given us an indication of where we might want to start looking for intervention for better ergonomics. And we'll come back to this in, in a short while. Just looking at other risk factors then, force maybe is one common risk factor for muscular fetal disorders. And is it really an issue for tablet PCs and mobile phones? Well, it's rather disheartening, but Corky's uh, findings have suggested that people are uh, possibly at risk of suffering problems with the nerve endings in the ends of their fingers from touch screens. It's hard to put this in some kind of risk category when we're talking usually about forces of, of kilograms of force for manual handling, for example, and it's hard to believe that touching a touch screen could cause problems with the fingers, but there is other evidence that supports that kind of an issue. Um, Owen and Sesto found that people are touching touch screens about six times harder than required. We're all frustratedly tapping on our touch screens with too much force. So it may be an emergent issue. It may be something that we're called upon to look at in the future. But one thing that we've heard of here in, in um, HSL is, is something more about the non-dominant hand, the hand that you're holding the tablet with. And that non-dominant hand, especially if you're doing, we've heard it with, with sales forces at the door, at people's homes where they're doing a presentation on a tablet and showing other people the, the, the images and so forth on the tablet, holding the tablet up with their non-dominant hand. We've heard this has led to quite an increased prevalence of you know, shoulder problems and elbow problems and problems in that non-dominant hand and that's supported by literature. Just looking at that, that, that kind of holding of a tablet, you know, applying a little bit of very cursory uh, biomechanics to that, if you look at an average tablet there, it's a, I think it's an iPad, but it could be anything with just average with a convenient image to use. Looking at that, if, we, if we're holding a tablet on its edge and the tablet's on average uh, 24 centimeters wide, an average over eight tablets, so the center of mass of a tablet is about 12 centimeters away from a, the, the center. 
just a, a simple pivot force of an average weight of a half a kilogram per tablet, just some very cursory biomechanics, puts around three, three and a half kilograms worth of force of pinch grip in the non-dominant hand. And we know from work from Silverstein, which is in BSEN 894 as well, that uh, she found that uh, um, pinching grips or, or, or pinching an object that was a kilogram of weight with a pinch grip would be enough to create a, put you in a high hazard or high risk zone for, for pinch-related uh, injury. But four-handed gripping, using all the fingers and the thumb and a four-handed grip, a four kilograms worth of force or beyond, anything more than that put you in a higher risk category as well. And we are approaching those kinds of forces which have shown have been shown to actually put us in a high risk category. So it is an issue, it is something that we want to be uh, bearing in mind with our risk uh, uh, management and, and our, our systems in place to reduce the risk. Finally, in terms of exposure, the last of the key risk factors, looking at duration and repetition of exposure. The key issue we have here is that it's a self-selection. And there's something very attractive about a tablet PC. Me and my family all use tablet PCs at home. We talk occasionally, but not only when there's nothing good on Netflix or other streaming programs. It is a self-selection, and we've got home exposure as well as work exposure to deal with. The thing about work, what we can control is what do we, what do we reward? Do we reward the people who work until 10 o'clock at night on our Blackberries or on tablets, sending emails, reviewing the day's work, and so forth? Or do we have a policy in place that suggests we can uh, limit repetition and duration of exposure? What are the expectations and what are the social boundaries we're allowed to do? Is it acceptable to send an email at 9 o'clock at night to a colleague and expect them maybe to answer it? Have we got anything in our policies that actually uh, set these boundaries and set what the expectations are? So they're the key risk factors, and it's obvious that they do come into play. It's obvious that they are pertinent to mobile DSC as they are to, to other forms of uh, musculoskeletal possibilities and risk. So the question is, what do we do about it? What's the, what's the approach to control? And there are a number of ways of approaching control. In the UK, we often follow the hierarchy of controls I'm sure many are familiar with, where we start by eliminating the hazard source and run through this hi hierarchy, reducing the hazard or removing the person from the hazard and so forth. And we can start to employ this for mobile device. We can use peripherals to eliminate problems like holding the device, put it on a stand, for example. If we can't eliminate holding the device, we can just choose to purchase the lighter devices, ones that are easier to hold and get the improved designs, making holding the device easier. To some degree, we can move people from the hazard. We can only uh, yeah, re reduce exposure to certain people who've got pre-existing injuries, people who've got a propensity for neck pain, for example, is a possibility. And then containing the hazard, containing it in terms of time of exposure. Again, setting policies to, to nudge people towards expectations and, and, and reasonable use. And then just reducing individual exposure through organizational interventions and through behavioral interventions. I think that's going to be a key element to the interventions we can take with, uh, with mobile devices. They're the kind of things that may be effective in people's living rooms and home life uh, where we can't be there to manage them in a normal sense. In terms of risk control then, it's like the very, very heart of ergonomics. It's about fitting the device to the user and their use. Now, I had a quick look on, on Google for some uh, possible uh, solutions by looking at iPad stand, and Google returned back to me 440 million possibilities in terms of products. And the key to this is there is a product, there is a device, and a peripheral, peripheral device or support for every single occasion. There are an awful lot of possibilities for us. And just to give you some examples of these, we don't endorse any of them. Um, we just think these are quite interesting ones to highlight an issue that there is a device for everything. As I mentioned before, 80% plus of use of mobile devices are in the bedroom. And the first one of these solutions is something to just hold the device while you are watching your, your, your streaming videos in bed. The next one of those in my hometown, using it in the supermarket, I wouldn't get very far in my hometown without being confronted by possibly somebody wants to steal the tablet from it. But it's just demonstrating that there is 
a peripheral a holding device, there is a solution for every single eventuality in almost every single environment. These latter two are maybe more pertinent to work. We wouldn't endorse either of those postures, neither of them are in a really good posture, um, and there are better ways of setting up a mobile device, but certainly they highlight that there are solutions there that we could use if it's appropriate, especially in the car, where we could use um, you know, a peripheral device to you know, support a better posture and limit the kind of non-neutral fixed postures that we're seeing with these devices. And, and this, this last one is more for comic relief, but it's really just to show that there's almost not a single eventuality where a device hasn't been invented by somebody. And so we truly have got these uh, peripherals for every single occasion in every single environment. If the non-preferred hand holding device is, is causing problems, there are ways of avoiding grip altogether, and most of these solutions come in at under £20 from the usual uh, online retailers. You know, avoiding grip by putting simple straps and so forth on the backs of the device. Or if we are gripping a device, enabling a better and easier grip, reducing the grip force by making materials that enable an easier grip, for example, like these rubberized surfaces. Where the device is being used for you know, long periods of time, DSC regulations talks about habitual, in the UK, DSC regulations talks about habitual use of periods of an hour or more, for example. Then can we uh, support that if that's what's happening, just through you know, providing those peripherals that you know, allow a, a more suitable posture while you're engaging with them, allowing people these kind of peripheral keyboards and so forth. The things that are more used to seeing with uh, laptops and those kinds of uh, more traditional mobile computing. Very, very inexpensive. Certainly three of those are coming at less than £20 uh, for the product. Obviously, normally, like all products, you get what you pay for. But we don't have to spend a lot of money getting good products in, the, in place to just support a better posture for prolong, prolonged use. And the idea is we're trying to emulate this kind of thing, this kind of standard DSC approach, even at home, for example, in this case, it's obviously a laptop and a riser. We're trying to emulate that with these devices, reducing the neck flexion, improving the back posture, and allowing people to sustain a more neutral posture for longer while using and interacting with their uh, the mobile DSC. The problem with mobile DSC, though, is that it's mobile. Uh, our traditional forms of, of intervention for DSC and displacement equipment management aren't going to work. The, the kind of checklists and looking at workstation posture and, and what the workstation does to the posture in terms of table height, chairs and so forth, is not something we can rely on when we're using these devices all over the place, on you know, the, the trains and the sofa and in our cars occasionally. Obviously not when we're driving, we wouldn't endorse that. But our normal monitoring in office-based systems aren't really applicable. We've got to give people the skills and the understanding to make their own assessment, provide them with the knowledge uh, to assess whether their usage may be the kinds of levels of usage and postures and so forth that could lead to a higher risk of musculoskeletal disorders. It's about giving people, empowering people with that knowledge. And so realistically, it's about changing behavior intervening with behavior, which is something of a black art for many, but thankfully there are some really good systems that we can use to actually change behavior. One or two of these have been shown to work in, in, in certain environments. For example, this, uh, this particular model for behavior change from Lundben and Hopkinson, colleagues of mine in HSL, this is shown to work in construction sites to get the construction workers to wear PPE. Now the idea of this, this behavior change model is there are six key elements which we'll look at very briefly. And we have to start hitting all six of these key elements to get behavior to change, to get people to transfer good behaviors to their home life. Now, it seems like a softer management approach, but this is really, the, the, the value of this is it's transferable. And it's transferable not just to the work they're doing on the tablets and the mobile device, but also on the home activities that they'll also be doing on the tablets as well. If we can get good behaviors embedded through these six pre principles in the workplace where we have control, we've got a far greater chance of getting those good behaviors repeated at home when people are using their devices for their work activity and also home activity. So 
let's have a quick look at these six issues and, and a very brief look at how we can intervene to uh, use these with mobile DSC. The first one is give people, give users the right knowledge. Let people understand basic anatomy and what may cause an injury. If they've got an aching neck, what might that lead to? And what are those symptoms and what they're indicative of? But what's also good? What are the good postures and what are the things we want to try and get them to attain? Make sure we have the knowledge embedded in our training programs, information we're giving people. And just what is the company policy? What's the policy on usage? What's the policy on you know, daily exposure? Make sure people, are, our users are aware of that. And there's also lots of supportive kinds of softwares out there. YouTube have got these mobile clips that Vodafone put together. There are also apps around. I've not looked at uh, many apps, but I've only looked at a few apps just to see what they're like. And they're quite usable. I, I don't have a, an iPhone myself, so sorry, it's not a, um, it's only on a Google Play for Android apps. But there are apps we can intervene. And the beauty of all these softwares is people, the point of delivery, people look at them and use them on their tablet and or on their mobile uh, phones. So they are actually you know, engendering those good behaviors on the devices they're talking about. So those knowledge, we want to make people personally susceptible, make them understand, to be motivated to do something about it. You know, we all invest, or some of us invest in, in the lotto or the national lottery schemes. And the key message there is it, it could be you. The suggestion is you could win all those millions of euros and pounds. Unfortunately, it probably couldn't be you, to be honest. But that idea that it could be you, the very idea makes us personally believe that it could be us, makes us personally change our behavior, and in those cases, give up some money for a lottery ticket. In this case, personal susceptibility is about engendering the idea that it could be that person, that individual you're talking to, your users and your workforce, that could sustain those kinds of ailments and disorders. By doing that, we sometimes use injury statistics uh, but it's really more powerful to give individual case studies. Case studies of somebody who walks, works on the next desk or in, in the next office. Case studies from your own organization that are far more easily to relate to for your workforce. So where you have a case study of a musculoskeletal disorder, have those individuals you know, write about how they got, what happened to them, how they got better, and what it all felt like. So it really engenders that personal sensibility. Also, getting people know about early reporting of symptoms and what their symptoms may look like. And there's an awful lot of traffic tracking software that nowadays, just measuring your usage, measuring your exposure, whether it's exposure to sedentary work or just looking at screens. And we use these on our kids, and then we, we limit the kids' exposure to screens up to an hour a day, maybe. That kind of intervention is freely available in apps, and there's some really good uh, products out there that let people just realize how much they are looking at these devices. It's also about skill, giving people the right skills. Maybe the skills are shortcuts on the device that they can use, ways to make them work faster or easier. These are BlackBerry shortcuts shown there in green. But skills in their own workstation setup in self-assessment. It's a transferable skill that they can use any time they're using the device. There's little reminders. Using the finger and the thumb instead of just the finger or the thumb. But you know, changing exposure on the digits and those kinds of things. And like we know with training, the play is, is very important to training. So giving people some time to play activities, don't knock down device, but do give them a chance to play on the device to get to know them and get to know the shortcuts themselves. The support in terms of psychosocial support, what the expectations are maybe, supporting early reporting systems, um, early intervention systems without there being kind of a a black mark against the individual's names. Looking at those policies and supporting people with policies. What is a policy when people are using their blackberries? Do you have one? And if not, what will it be? Do we suggest that when you're out of the office uh, in a more mobile situation, you should check your emails once a day maybe, as opposed to every time you get half a minute to quickly glance down and respond? Do you have a policy to support this? Then planning, planning for success, looking at uh, you know, good behaviors in your performance agreements and allocating work uh, effectively, and, and you know, plan to turn the device off, let people know when your device will be on and off, if it's acceptable in your, in your, um, your diary systems to, to get in contact with them or otherwise, what the expectations may be. But planning for 
that uh, you know, success and success in terms of exposure as well as posture. And that's really about engaging workers and finding out what works for those individuals. And then finally, you can put all these things, things in place. It becomes the important thing for the day, and then people revert back to you know, the learned behavior. So it's about putting in those uh, sustaining programs, the social nudges, the toolbox polls, the posters around. You know, an example of BT's Adjust and Relax um, Sustaining Awareness Program, which is freely available online, and we're grateful for them to, for them to, to provide that for us. Putting those sustaining elements in that keep it at the forefront of people's minds, maybe a stick on a device or a bit of guidance in the device as it starts up, uh, suggesting how long they should be on it, or something like that. Something that lets people make those decisions, the decision-making opportunities while they're using the device. And the key to this very, very quick look at behavior changes is about having all six of these elements in place. It's about touching all of these. Any one of them is like a hole in a sieve, and you'll start to lose people, start to lose behaviors. It's about trying to touch all of these in the policies and interventions. There are more complex ways of looking at behavior. There are far more uh, um, academic ways of looking at behavior, maybe more successful even. Uh, for example, this is an ACT model that is a, the next evolution of the behavior change model I just showed you. So there are lots of these, and I think in terms of your policies for now, it's about looking at these and trying to uh, fulfill these within your policies, especially in light of the fact that there isn't anything being published at the moment that tells you exactly how to go about doing an assessment. So in summary, we know that exposure is up. We know that risks are present. We need to stick with what we know. We need to stick with good posture. We need to stick with that standard approach as good postures in DSC, but those standard DSC approaches won't work. So it's about careful choices of peripheries, letting the user decide, but then you know, putting in social systems to help them use them. Because peripheries only, peripheries only work if people are using them, and so it's behavior that is the key. And HSE stands while they're actually now publishing or writing and putting together the guidance on the and DSC assessment. In, in the new version of L26, which hopefully will be published at the end of this year. And even looking at that, as early stages of looking at that, I think with mobile devices, behavior and behavior interventions will be a key. And we shall be moving away from the standard office-based DSC assessment approaches, which we're all familiar with. And I think that's my 25 minutes. And so I hope that's been interesting, how it's been useful. And do go look at your policies and see if you can building any elements of these behavior approaches in the policies to try and get closer to a, a behavior change effect which will lead to better postures and reduced exposure. Thanks very much for your time. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, uh, Matt. That was indeed a lot of information as ever. Um, and uh, I suppose we are pushing the boundaries of our transmission time at the moment, so please Forgive me, people, if I'm keeping you from your lunch. Um, but uh, certainly what you presented, Matt, um, shows the, I think, if nothing else, it shows the depth of research that you go into in order to provide the guidance that we as the punters um, use in our everyday um, workplaces. Um, and on that sort of note, there have been a number of questions really looking at the point that you mentioned just at the end there about the revised, uh, well, some have asked about revised regulations, some are talking about revised guidance. Um, mm. I think we'll leave the questions really, uh, those questions for perhaps you to just repeat uh, when we get um, the recording uh, on the, uh, the website. Um, there were another couple of questions about the uh, references that you gave. Um, in terms of the apps and so forth, and, and perhaps you, I don't know, perhaps you'll be able to um, give us a, a more complete um, direction as to where to find those. Um, one question I will just quickly ask, because uh, it's nice to have you there and available. Um, one question is, is it better from a postural point of view to use a separate keyboard if possible? It, if you're using the device to input, so writing an email and, and, and so forth, then yes. I think if you can 
uh, use a, post, a, a keyboard or a separate uh, uh, peripheral like that to bring the screen higher up, closer to eye height. It doesn't have to be exactly at eye height as we specify with the office-based uh, workstations, but closer to eye height and bring the screen up so that you're next in a more neutral posture, then the keyboard really would be a, a, a good way of doing that. If you're going to be looking at the screen in that standard kind of computer use mode for you know, a few minutes, certainly, and, and certainly over an hour if you're doing emails for over an hour on a tablet, then a peripheral screen to raise the tablet would be, uh, sorry, a peripheral keyboard to raise the tablet would be a very good idea, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Um, I fear that because of the time, we're going to have to cut the questions short there. But um, every or the questions that have been asked, we will get uh, ask Matt to answer um, on the website for you. Um, it'll be early next week. But um, if I can just now just thank Matthew for uh, that uh, presentation and for the information. I'm I'm sure this is something we're going to come back to, and as you mentioned uh, later on, it looks like we're going to have some some new guidance from the HSE, uh, and so we look forward to that, and perhaps to have a, a return um, presentation from you uh, in terms of when we get the more detail on that, if 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 you're able. It would be my um, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so. To everyone, I hope you found that uh, presentation helpful to you. Um, but if you did come in late or you want to listen to it again, you want to pick up whatever the references were that, that Matt was able to give on the screen, then this has been recorded. It will be available on the Posturite webinar website, uh, web page, um, probably uh, early next week sometime. And please uh, have a look there. And if you still got questions, then come back to us and we can channel any difficult ones that we can't answer um, back to Matt and I'm sure he'll, he'll help us out. So uh, oh, finally it, it needs for me to tell you that uh, we hope you'll join us for the next webinar which is uh, going to be presented by Catherine Metters um, and it's called Designing a Good Work Environment. So for now thank you very much for listening and I hope you have a good afternoon. So uh, goodbye to all. Bye.